vocabulary research, we use theory to inform the action. Uh, and here we would like uh, literature as well to help ground the action being done. But uh, in addition to the usual literature, we want action that is guided by reflection and that is really influencing practice. And it, it's also collaborative. It involves people who are normally treated as subjects in mainstream research, but they become also co-designers of uh, solving practical issues that they face on an everyday basis. So action research therefore is guided by core principles of practicality, uh, reflection, engagement, and collaboration. So in, spe in specific terms, subjects and researchers are jointly responsible for developing and evaluating the theory to ensure that the research, question, uh, the research uh, line reflects the knowledge created through the participative process and it helps improve the social situation of the subjects. Now, Kurt Levin is mentioned here and he's generally recognized as the father of action research. Uh, he, uh, during the World War II period, he was very instrumental in tackling important questions about uh, why people would part, uh, pursue certain types of research approaches, whether they may be uh, democratic or autocratic. Uh, of course, your, your history will tell you that this was uh, a period where fascism and uh, oppression of human rights was very common. And Levin was struggling with that issue that why human beings would choose to behave in ways that would tend to oppress others. And he tackled that issue using a very experimental approach. But for him, the experiment was a social experiment. It wasn't dealing with uh, test tubes and, and uh, pendulums, but it was dealing with human beings uh, trying different approaches to getting goals approved or goals achieved rather. So Levin is uh, to this day recognized as the father of action research. So again, in mainstream research, there's a lot of uh, focus on rigor, methodology, uh, quantification, very strict uh, criteria for, for hypothesis testing, et cetera. And often the problem we see is that uh, re re relevance and rigor are seen as being uh, at cross purposes. So in the sense that uh, if, if we do quote unquote scientific research, which is considered rigorous in mainstream research, it sometimes becomes fa farther and farther away from the real lives of people. So typically when we give questionnaires, for example, for surveys, uh, oftentimes the questionnaires were designed by the researchers uh, without the knowledge of the subjects, quote unquote, and it, it often derives from the experience of the researchers and not the subjects. So, but in action research, we try to position the research as being both achieving relevance, meaning close to the reality of the research uh, subjects, but also rigorous, but not rigorous in the positive sense, positivist sense of being necessarily quantitative, et cetera, but rigorous in the sense that it involves uh, deep reflection, uh, experimental, um, innovation in methodology, so that this, this uh, types of researchers research become uh, seen as quality in that uh, combined perspective. So our relevance and our rigor become intertwined rather than being opposed to each other. Another flavor of action research is called uh, critical participatory action research. Here, uh, this is action research that expresses a commitment to bring together broad social analysis and self-reflective collective self-study of practice and transformational action to improve things. So here we bring in uh, the idea that human beings are embedded in social structures and uh, which act on us in ways that we are sometimes not aware of so that uh, we need to study those structures because in, in the, to any extent that they might be oppressive or uh, not emancipatory, meaning not allowing us to flourish to our full potential, we can look at how we can change these structures. So CPAR has a long history of exposing the nature of this empowerment in industrialized societies, which is of course the, the dominant form of societies today. And in recent times has incorporated uh, involving uh, identities, uh, people's identities and their sense of social justice uh, to understanding what needs to be changed. So CPAR is a very uh, 
popular flavor of action research among those who really want to address justice issues. So uh, in, in some of the experiences we'll be sharing, you will see that very strong flavor of emancipation and dealing with unjust systems. So I hope that this brief overview gives you a very clear idea how action research is quite distinct from mainstream research in that it really tries to act on real issues of the day and it involves the people who are embedded in those issues, but also while being informed by uh, literature, theory, and all the usual uh, inputs that we use as scholars. So that, uh, that ends our overview of action research. And so back to you, Patch. All right, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, we have a question already in the chat. I think it's from Katerina. So sorry if I mispronounced your name. I'm not good with pronouncing uh, different variations of names. But uh, Katerina asks, what are the state-of-the-art methods in action research since acceleration to all remote? How, the, how does action research has changed? What about non-participatory action research? How is it conducted? So would you want to answer this already or should we proceed to the applications? Well, I'll, I'll give a quick answer and maybe my, my colleagues can share what they think. Uh, because action research is very context based. So it really, the, the methods really evolve uh, with the context and where the subjects are. So certainly the pandemic has forced us to look at computer mediated uh, action research as one emerging form. And uh, we are now this has not been uh, documented very fully, but these are things that we are now looking at because uh, typically we look at people through squares in screens now. So this is uh, where a lot of the nuances of uh, nonverbal interaction is, is not easily captured, but uh, action researchers need to really go deeply into deeper dialogue and to develop deeper rapport with people as they deal with them through a computer mediated uh, medium like Zoom. Etc. So that would be my quick take on it. So it's still an evolving field because of the, the developments in the pandemic. Patch? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the other panelists or the other discussants will be able to answer Katerina's question as we move along in the applications. All right. So feel free to continue asking questions in the chat so we can collate them and then uh, we will be discussing them during the question and answer portion of our webinar this, uh, this day. All right. So now we will immediately proceed to the second portion of our event where we invite discussants to discuss the applications of action research to teaching, research, practice, and service. So our first panel is Dr. Sonny Jong, the assistant professor from Wittenberg University. So Dr. Sonny is a compassionate scholar and dedicated um, leader and life coach with over 10 years experience teaching and coaching self-development, leadership, and cross-cultural competence development. Her research interests lie at the confluence of transformational leadership and business practices and participatory action research. So without further ado, I turn over the floor to Dr. Sonny Jong. Uh, thank you so much, Pets. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming in. Um, I know I'm logging in from Springfield, Ohio. Um, USA, but many of you are probably either very late night or early morning, so welcome. Um, so my portions of applications that I like to specifically talk about the one uh, participatory action research method, photo voice. So photo voice, um, when I talk about it, uh, it started fairly new 1992, but when I was using other uh, participatory action research, I, I felt it's limited uh, in, in my classroom settings and also uh, bringing the voices from the marginalized, people who usually don't have a voice in the society, like the people who are um, victims of domestic violence, homeless, and the youth or children in a school setting, et cetera. So let me introduce Photo Voice. I'm focusing on it, and um, I'll skip some other parts that I have prepared about the extra research components of it, but I'll make sure that my slides will be shared with all of you. So the portions that I'm, I'm talking about, I know um, 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 Dr. Um, Deven uh, talked a little about the extra research components of the definitions. It's worthwhile to uh, mention 
the Peter Robinson's work in 1984, the origins and status of action research that he published in Journal of Applied Behavior Science. And he talked about the action research is not about the methodology, but it's a set, it's, it's not only about methodology and set of tools, but also it's a theory. So there has been uh, from 1940, there is a 30, 40 years uh, built uh, foundations on action research. And he believes that uh, amount of work that has been um, presented and published and extra research is more than enough to claim as a theory than uh, method. Uh, but that's, uh, that's an, again, the worth of reading. So I hope that you'll find the time to, to read some of those um, extra research articles. So um, one thing that I'd like to also mention is about the multiple modalities of action research. There has been two major streams of action research. I know um, Katrina um, asked about, what about non-participatory action research? Um, the initial work of action research that has been founded from the Kurt Lewin in early 1940 at the MIT, um, his focus was more about theory and action um, as a scholar, not so much about the participatory parts. And the north part of, of hemisphere um, in the world, including UK and many of European countries, uh, they focus a lot about social technical work of the action research and again, emphasizing actions and uh, building theory. But the southern part of consciousness raising work of uh, Paolo uh, Freire that I'll talk about a little more and the Marxist based liber liberation movements in the southern parts of the world and they often talk more about the participation as a focus in action research. So there are two major streams of work that has been uh, developed a little separately from the beginning of 1940 until uh, 1970. So it might be worth of, of looking at those um, literatures as well. So here is the uh, mode, mode two, one into action research table that I'm sharing with you uh, that has been um, developed and, and published in, in the annual, Academy of Management Annals uh, by the David Copeland. And he talked about uh, researchers role in action research is not observer, it's actor. So researcher who are participating in the participatory action research, we are not observing things um, the subjects are doing. We are participating as an actor, also agent of change as well. So it's worth of mentioning those moving into my photo voice method application to my classroom and my research. So again, um, photo voice portions that I mentioned about, it was credited um, to uh, Caroline Wang of the University of Michigan. Um, she was working at the School of Public Health at the time, and also Mary Ann Burris. Uh, she was a program director of um, women's health at the Ford Foundations that was headquartered in Beijing at the time. So two of uh, them were working with the women in the Yunnan province of China as part of the Ford Foundation supported um, the women's reproductive health and development program. So this initiative is basically um, giving foundations of how we can adopt the photo voice method as a participatory action research. So basically participants are using photo photograph um, to moderate or facilitate, um, identify and reflect on issues of importance to them. And then they facilitate and um, make the desired changes happen. So when you look at the left side of the, my slide, the images of photo voice path, uh, at the beginning, um, you are working as a scholar, you're working with the participants and teach them about the photo voice and introducing them how to do it. And the people will go out and either take a photographs or they'll bring the photographs that they know that fits into the topic um, that um, participants are discussing. And as a group, and um, people will discuss about those photographs and, and share the narratives and their lived experiences. And once and while they are sharing their experiences, um, the scholars are writing or dictating the narratives that's been shared. And, and after um, we choosing the photos, for sharing with the bigger audience beyond the, of the participants who brought the pictures. And it's optional that um, inviting people to come and share further in discussions and um, figuring out the ways to change the policy or environment of, of the settings that subjects are raising questions or inquiries on. Um, so I'll show how I did it 
in my classroom. So at the beginning, I introduced about the border voice in very simple um, three step. And you go out and observe what are you singing in the photos, what is happening in the photos with many others. We analyze it together, and then we act on it. So I applied photo voice method in my teaching and practice a couple of times and since 2018 fall. So 2018 fall and spring 2021, while I was teaching business research method, I introduced photo voice research method to groups of students. Uh, typically I have about 30 students in each class and um, fall 2018, I had a two sections of it. So I had about 61 students who are using photo voice. So I collected all the photos and made a, a publications in book chapter. Um, and I share those in the shared documents later on that you will have access to it. Then also spring 2019 in my class of social entrepreneurship, also I applied photo voice method in the group project that students were using it to improve the campus uh, learning environment. So in 2018 and 2021, this semester, so this is a process that I did for photo voice application to my classroom. The step one is prep. So you have to introduce photo voice method to students and how those are working step by step. And we chose the topic at the time as happiness. I gave students many different topics that they like to um, work on. Since this is um, the research method class, they can use any topic that they like. Students with their majority of votes, they chose to work on happiness as their topic of project. So we contextualize those happiness um, into our work. So I'm participating as all my students are participating in the project. And then we created the teams and each team has about four to five people. And I gave them timeline how they can um, finish their work by the time that they need to present again. So they presented twice. So I'll, I'll talk all the aspects of it. So at the very beginning as an assignment, the students need to submit three photos of describing the happiness moment of their life. And they need to also write the narratives under each photos. And then I ask them to meet as a group to converse and choose only one photo out of three. So students will only bring one photo to the classroom to share their narratives and have in-class discussion. So you can see, this is the pictures that I took after students post their individual photo um, depicting um, the happiest moments. And then we share the narratives and ask the questions, get clarifications, and then we do analysis. So when they brought the pictures, again, each student have, um, has one picture to share and they present it to the entire class and they share the narratives of that picture. Um, and when they present it, the students are asking questions to clarify and, and um, whether they share and um, validating the experiences or they feel like this is unique and different than mine. So they have a free flow conversation back and forth. And I'm using the showed method that has been used by again, Caroline Wong in her research. So when I asked them describe the narratives, I gave them the framework of showed. What do you see here in this picture and um, what is really happening and how does it relate to our lives and why this is happening and how could the image educated other people uh, what can I do to duplicate it? So again, the D, what can I do to duplicate is a part that we discuss a lot heavier later on about action. So um, examples of showed presentations um, by one of students of mine, the Chase Bishop. So he brought the pictures of his mom when he was young and he was dancing with mom. So his, um, his descriptions of showed method was um, what do you see here? I see my mom dancing, me and my mom are sharing happy moments, me and my mom are very close. And, and age, what's really happening here? I was so extremely happy and proud of my mother in the picture. I strive to be like her in so many ways. At this moment, I was so happy to be her son. And, um, and um, oh, how does it relate to our lives? Everyone has a mother, if you choose to speak to them or not, there's only one woman that brought you in this world, at least love them just for that. And, and W, why this is happening. So this happens because you create an unbreakable bond with your mother and, and have uh, memorable events like a dancing here. And then do, um, how will you duplicate? What will you do to duplicate? How will you sustain this moment? And 
and be thankful for everyone, everyone, everything, everyone that you have in your life. Be nice to your parents and remember that you will, they were not perfect, but that's okay. And, and students, again, adding comments and asking questions and they, uh, they are either validating and sharing the same, um, the moments or the same relationship they have with their parents. And so um, you can see some comments on the right side um, that students are adding to um, this one specific picture. And after students finished their presentations, we did a data coding and um, finding a theme. It's almost like a um, qualitative research method uh, analysis portion that I, I'm using based on the grounded theory technique uh, that has been introduced by the Strauss and Tobin in 1990. So what we have done here, as you can see in the picture, that the students are writing the code. So when they're presenting it and with the discussions in the classroom and with the post-it, so they can write it down what code they can assign for each picture. So for example, um, the Chase's pictures with mom, it will say relationship with the parents or um, bonding event or special event or dancing. So we, we have uh, multiple codes of each pictures and we post under the picture. After everyone um, coded their, their pictures together in a classroom and we did the categorizations and finding a team. So the, the categories you can see in this picture that I'm sharing with you, the events and achievements and, and relations is particularly from one class uh, that I taught and the students categorize um, um, there are three themes we found how people find their happiness. One is they have a meaningful events uh, with people that they care or they participate in special events. They go to uh, music concerts and they go to the wedding ceremony of their cousin, etc. And then the other main theme is achievements of success. I was recognized by the teams or uh, the groups of, of people that who got awarded and I'm the uh, top one who got awarded. Um, it's a self um, confidence and it's about the pride. And the third portion is relationship. We have a close relationship with the family and the friends um, that comes to my um, and play in my prom night or um, they all came to support when I was um, in depressions. So there are many narratives that has been shared along those three themes. And, and then after each class that I created the award cloud, um, the picture depicting what are the main uh, codes that are showing the most uh, popular among the people who share it. As you can see, the one that has been uh, created in the fall 2018, and on the right side that's created in spring this semester 2021, they're very similar, but at the same time, they're very specific. Again, um, the participatory action research and photo voice is uh, contextualized um, in, in their situations in time. So it can be the same. So the types of knowledges we are acquiring here in the participatory action research is not about generalizable theory or knowledges. It's more actionable knowledge that is particular and situational. So uh, moving forward, the after this code and categories has been um, identified and we do the further group reflection. So this is where students really go deeper and then finding the meaning making and perspective taking in, in their discussions of the topic that we, we chose. So again, the, we, we were discussing at the time about the happiness. So the group presented as a group at the end about the reflection. So the main portion that they really emphasize is how we can live a better, happier life, um, how we can action, how we can sustain the happiness moment that we presented, how we can act on um, bringing the better happiness. So there are a couple of teams who presented after um, the, the, their group reflection and meaning making is done within their group. So one group talks about happiness is important and valuable, especially the college students that they mentioned um, the happiness is one of the extraordinary important uh, factors in their lives, about 6.39 out of seven scales. Um, so they did the same way that this study has done to their own friends, about 60, 70 um, the subjects. So they asked students, their friends, about the, what, is a, what is the important qualities of life that you are 
are really um, thinking that that's, that's the, the, uh, the most important. And they found the same result. They found the students answered, um, happiness is one, not one of, it's the most important quality of life that they, they believe in their life. But then they also ask a question, then what percent of your time that do you allocate it to either success or uh, happiness? of the above qualifications of the life. And, and then, <laughs> interestingly, this team found out the students allocated the most of their time in success, achieving um, success. So working on their GPA, the papers and exams and internships and all that, uh, focusing on achievements and success as a team of happiness, but not necessarily uh, really pursuing the happiness itself. So they found the gap in, in students' life and they mentioned students need to intentionally thinking and pursuing the happiness if they really like to be happy. In the same, uh, in the same um, manner, other team also found out other research and they presented uh, when students are um, bringing their families and friends in their life a little more. So the study that involved the 300 students who reported that when they regularly spend about a quarter of hours more uh, each day with their friends and family, and that they're 12 times as likely to report happiness. So again, emphasizing the relationship building, how you can go about intentionally building that types of um, uh, relationship and strengthening that relationship and paying attention to it. And the last team, when they presented about their group reflection, they actually brought interesting aspects of the meaning and purpose for your life in pursuing happiness. Um, they presented with a video of their own talk and, and they commented, um, do not strive for happiness alone, but seek a meaning and purpose for your life, no matter how big or little. So they uh, uh, reflected on um, the happiness aspects of, of sharing and helping others. Uh, that's the part of the something bigger than themselves that make the people more happier. And then they ask people that you should join that, that effort. Um, the one of students as an individual, she wrote a reflection himself and he said, to be happy, you know, um, you should be more spontaneous. You should be more uh, open-minded and not fixed on what you really need to do, how you need to do. So he shared his own picture um, that he took again after the first round that he presented his picture. Uh, Andrew uh, brought the pictures of dinner setting that he set the dinner for his girlfriend. And he said, you see a table with the flowers and candles in the picture. I decided to surprise my girlfriend with a candlelight dinner. This was for no special occasion, just random. But I believe people in general need to be more spontaneous, right? And that's the key to happiness, uh, organized structures. And those things are great, but sometimes the spur of the moment is really what you need to, um, to pursue. So again, um, there is a deeper meaning making process happening after students finish their presentations. They go back with the group and work on um, meaning making perspective, taking aspects of photographs. So when part four uh, is hello, done- Sunny. So, Hello, mm -hmm. Sunny. Hello, uh, Sunny. Excuse me, uh, please wrap up in two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So, so I, I just want you to have some ideas how you can apply those in classrooms or how you can do that for your own research. So uh, the other aspects of photo voice in my classroom setting of social entrepreneurship class, the students brought the environmental issues of campus and you can see that there's a pothole picture, there is a dark campus, there's no light and there is a police standing um, on campus and also um, there is a food wasted in the cafeteria. So the, the important thing is like action portion. After this, they work with the uh, campus committee, they work with the vice presidents of finance, and they are meeting with the police, um, campus police, and to uh, uh, bring the changes that they desire. So I wanted to think about how you can apply affordable in research and also teaching and practice and services. There is an important piece that I want you to think about, the empowerment engagement and the process of engaging all voices all voices of everyone in your work that you do. Again, I'm gonna share my slide with everyone so you can see more details of application in your research and teaching and service. So in conclusion, photo voice democratizes the process of research to generalize shared knowledge and actionable policy as it increases critical consciousness, connectedness, and agency among its participants. 
Again, Board Voice is a participatory action research approach that can result in transformations of individuals' organizations when used effectively at the workplace. So my summary, my own voice, I believe action research, especially the photo voice, is at the frontier of management and organization research. Hopefully um, some of you are motivated to use, or if you're using it already, that consider adopting the photo voice for one of your projects. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patch. Thank you very much, Asani. So that was a very insightful presentation of a very cutting edge action research. I've been getting some messages of people who had to leave and are very eager to get copies of your slides. And I have some students who are uh, who want to apply it in their own research. So for your questions, uh, we'll be saving it for later so we can proceed smoothly with our next panelists. All right. So on to the next discussion of uh, her application of action research in her work. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicole Dillard, Assistant Professor of Organizational Leadership in of the Northern Kentucky University. Dr. Dillard is an assistant professor in organizational leadership with teaching privileges in the Master of Public Administration program. Dr. Dillard earned her doctorate degree in human and organizational learning from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. She has taught courses in leadership, human development, and organizational culture. Her primary research interest explores areas of women and leadership with a focus on narratives of mothering and work and the impact on the work life experiences of women of color. So without further ado, I turn over the floor to Dr. Nicole Dillard. Thanks, Patch. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for today's session. Um, I'm going to spend some time um, talking about um, critical participatory action research and specifically about one method. So as Sunny shared about a method of uh, photo voice, I'll be talking about a method called counter space, which is um, an interview technique that is quite simply a more critical um, reflective um, interpretation of, of what we would typically see in qualitative research as a focus group. And I saw some of the questions that were um, in the chat around uh, how to use uh, action research in, in terms of generating narratives or studying narratives, as well as uh, the question earlier around how can we apply action research to um, you know, this digital space that we're in now. And so I'll talk a little bit about you know, components of my own research and how I've applied it in, in service as well that will help answer some of those questions um, that were addressed in the chat. Um, I am physically, geographically, I'm calling in from um, Cincinnati, Ohio and USA, um, which is on the um, native lands of the Swanee, the Cherokee East and the Miami tribes, uh, indigenous tribes here in the US. So I'll, I'll skip a couple of slides in, in terms of our timing and um, you'll have a copy of my full slide deck um, to get more of the kind of definitional pieces related to critical participatory action research. But there are some um, key characteristics or components of CPAR that I do wanna spend some time discussing for those who may be newly introduced into CPAR. And specifically, you know, I've what you see in the screen here is that I've kind of um, broken down the characteristics in these four pillars of um, kind of the vital elements of uh, critical participatory action research or CPAR, which I'll refer to it during this uh, discussion. But the first part is the criticality, right? So there was conversation going on in the chat around. Um, you know, the various, the differences in the various types of action research and whether participa participation or co-researcher approaches are required in, um, in, in, in action research. And I would say one of the distinctions between CPAR and other types of action research is the criticality, right? That there is an element of critical research that is separate from general uh, traditions of qualitative research, like been talked earlier about kind of the positive approach to so the objective approach to research right and that the, the goal of critical participatory action research is not just one where we're exploring or providing commentary on some some social events or some systems but we're also primarily seeking to critique these systems right and that to 
the goal is, the essence is that we are providing some research for the goal of creating social change. And also some of what um, was shared in Sunny's presentation is the, the importance of empowerment and in, in supporting agency, right? In order to, to develop some of these counter narratives, especially in, as it's been utilized in the US for marginalized populations. And then I would say the second kind of core element of CPAR is the, of course, the uh, part participation of the what is framed in CPAR as co-researchers, right? So depending on your research tradition, you may call them as subjects, you may call them participants, right? In CPAR, the individuals that you're working with, right? It's a true partnership that you have the researcher in partnership with co-researchers, right? So the participants in the research, the participants in the studies are co-researchers co together, right? So this really uh, tackles the, the kind of traditional divide in research between the researcher and those who are being researched, right? And creates this more communal collective way where the researcher is embedded with the researchers, I mean, excuse me, with the, with the co-researchers in a way where there's mutual learning that's occurring. And it also is a collective pr a process, right? So it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, research tradition, right? It's the idea that the community has uh, ways of knowing that is vital to their own uh, problem solving, that they can participate and lead and co-design in the research process, right? So we're not just using kind of the, you know, traditionally recognized scholarly academic ways of knowing to solve problems in communities, but we are empowering communities to bring their own um, sovereignty and ways of knowing to the research tradition and the research practice, practice and process. And thirdly, I would say um, another defining characteristic of CPAR is that it is action oriented, right? So it is participant designed, right, with a goal in mind, right? And that process is that it is, you know, all of the processes leading in this research, although they be iterative, they're all very action oriented, right? So some of that action is internal in terms of the self reflection that's happening in the processes, which I'll talk a little bit more during um, when I when I talk about counter spaces, but also there's action in the collect building community, right? The community building processes, and then also in the final product of whatever the co-researchers decide the design is aimed to do. So typically that ends up being, you know, some form of community change. If it's within an organizational group, it's maybe a policy change that the group together is designing to bring to the leaders of organizations, right? But throughout the entire cycle that there's action that's happening on a change level at, you know, some of the micro levels as well as the macro levels. And then finally, you know, similarly, but a distinct component to this, uh, to the action oriented is that it's applied, right? That there is, it's not action for the sake of kind of, um, you know, just ideas of understanding self, but it's applied to a larger system, right? The core of, of CPAR is that it's changing systems, right? The things that are visible to us that may car cause harm as well as those that are invisible, right? So it is solving a problem. It has the self-reflective um, process in it, but it all is, it, it's in its core, it's solving a problem that is external as well. And it's key to understand that, you know, it the goal of CPAR is for there to be some application at a variety of levels, right? So some of it is the self piece, some of it may be, you know, meso, and some of it may be the micro um, or macro level analysis. So the specific um, tool that I typically use in my CPAR research um, is, is counter spaces. And you know, and from my tradition, you know, previously Ben and uh, Sunny uh, talked about, you know, some of the um, original or seminal scholars of um, action research, um, but the scholars that I tend to uh, center my research on are, are from traditions of marginalized communities. So scholars who 
you know, particularly for counter space, scholars who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, people from the global South who have contributed a significant scholarship and understanding to broaden action research. And one way where you can really see that is in this space of the counter, uh, counter space framework. So Sunny talked a little bit about the differences between you know, action researchers from the global South versus uh, the kind of um, Western or European traditions, right? So that is really evident in the counter space framework, right? A the majority of the scholars who have contributed to a greater understanding of this method have come from the global south or within the US from marginalized communities in the US. So you see a lot of scholars from black feminist theory, uh, Chicano studies, um, indigenous studies, right, that are framing a new way for us to think about how we can collect information in a communal way that honors some of the original ways of knowing an epistemology of people of color in the US and then those who are generally um, mostly impacted by systems of, of oppression globally, right? So the idea of counter spaces is, you know, I think an easier way to if you haven't been familiar with this method is to understand it as very similar to focus groups, right? So it is a collective way to collect data via interviewing, but it's not just the method of collecting data, right? It's a method of how we can collect data in a way that centers the ways of knowing of those who are in the circle, right? In the space, right? And it's also very critical in the sense that it, allows the participants or the co-researchers an opportunity to critique those systems that they are participants in or involved in that may have oppressive tendencies, behaviors, or patterns, right, or systems of oppression. And then furthermore, it's it's an idea, you know, here on the in the the quote for the definition is as counter spaces operate as a site of radical possibility. Right, so it's not just the site of collecting data about what's wrong and what uh, what are some of the challenges and the problems, but it's also a site to reimagine some of these uh, systems, some of these narratives that we're moving through and that we're living through for the possibility of how we can create something new, something regenerative and something more empowering for these communities who are participating in the counter spaces. And so what I want to do is talk about how I have used counter spaces specifically and then uh, CPAR in general in my own spaces of uh, research, uh, service, and, um, and, and teaching. So when I, uh, I'll start with teaching. Um, when I teach, typically when I go into a research method class and those of us who probably teach research methods can give you a, a outline framework of what is covered in these courses right and and they're very uh, tend to be very a positive uh, positivist approach to research and so in my research uh, methods courses I really intentionally provide students an opportunity to engage in uh, in methodologies methodologies that not only center um, non-dominant, uh, traditions or scholarships or methodologies and center those from scholars of color, scholars from the global south, right, scholars from marginalized communities, whatever that looks like in the context of where you live, right, here in the U.S. that typically for my courses we talk about scholars who are um, um, who are typically identified as L in the LGBT community, those who are in indigenous communities, uh, those who identify as Black, right, Latino or Latinx, right, so depending on your context that will vary. Uh, my research is U.S. based, so that tends to be, those tend to be the scholars that I center in the research methods. And so in the, my research methods class, the students explore some of these, what we would you know, in the academy call non-traditional ways of knowing or epistemologies, right, or non-traditional research methods or uh, approaches. And so we, I introduce counter spaces, I introduce CPAR and, and, in, and included in, you know, some of the seminal scholars that were mentioned in the previous presentations. You know, I also talk about scholars like Yoso or um, Marita Soto Manning or Solorzano or 
uh, chemists, right? Some some scholars who who have redefined what we understand as uh, critical participatory action research from the space of an anti-oppressive approach, right? To help students not only get more exposure to these scholars, but to also learn different ways that we can do qualitative research methods. And in terms of um, service, you know, I. I I was thinking about the question around, you know, how do we do action research, particularly how do we do participatory action research in this digital space? And so I'll share with you that recently I, I completed um, a study, you know, we're all at institutions trying to figure out how to support our students' success, especially during related to mental health, you know, as they're navigating the pandemics or, you know, multiple pandemics and also trying to, to succeed and work academic spaces, you know, in their student lives. And, you know, I have a population of students that are um, working parents as well. So trying to balance all of those things and stay mentally well. And so I just finished a study with a colleague of mine around how to support, you know, Black students in the U.S. and their mental health as they're navigating not only, you know, COVID pandemic, but also a pandemic here of racial injustice in the U.S. And so in that process, we use CPAR, you know, and we're not face to face, you know, so during the study, we did a lot of digitally um, mediated counter space work, right? So we had collectively about uh, 40 students who participated in a virtual counter space, right? And in that counter space, the goal was for the students as co-researchers to generate suggestions and recommendations for the university of how the university can provide greater support for their mental wellness on campus right and so for those who may be new to counter spaces we use counter space as one method in addition to um, a review of best practices across institutions in the u.s as well as a we did an evaluation, a performance improvement evaluation of all of the resources that were provided for mental health on campus. So you can do CPAR strictly, excuse me, strictly using CPAR methods, but you can also combine it with other methods that feel more familiar to you, right? So you don't have to, you know, jump right into, you know, CPAR methods if you feel more, um, you know, uh, comfortable with some other quali more qualitative approaches or methods to your methodology, right? So there's flexibility in that um, approach. And so we allowed the students to, or not allowed the students, we invited the students to come in and to talk about their experiences on campus and how their mental well-being um, was being impacted not only by COVID, but by also the, you know, the climate of violence against Black bodies in this country. And in that process, we really engaged in how you know came up with a research question together uh talked about what we knew what we knew you know as the you know, quote unquote researchers versus what they knew as those who were sharing in the the actual lived experience on this campus and then from that they generated what they wanted to design as um almost like a gift to the university of how the university could support their well-being and so that became a curated a report that went to the university's um, working group on um, student wellness and it had a list of maybe 15 recommendations of where the students were really critical of the institution and provided some some concrete examples of how the university can shift can change and make some pivots to provide better support and services for them right and that was all done digitally right so the idea that participatory research has to be face-to-face -face live, right? Of course, that's ideal for us, but there is a space and there's, you know, processes for us to do that digitally. And then in terms of, you know, how I apply this into my own research, you know, I'll just share two um, projects that uh, I've also, you know, Ben will talk about, you know, how you can get access to some of our written publications on this work to give you a little bit more um, context. Um, and I'll share two with you that may be helpful in terms of one, how to do CPAR, but also to how, um, you know, an actual uh, empirical study of where CPAR was applied so you can see it in action and also learn kind of like the, the steps of doing it, right? And so, you know, the narrative question that came up in the chat 
was one, how do we use CPAR in a way to not only interrogate narratives, but also to develop counter narratives. And so, you know, I'll talk about um, some research I did around mothers in the workplace and mothers who had come together and they participated in the counter space where they were intentionally not only thinking about recommendations for their organizations to be more um, inclusive of mothers in the workplace, but also how they could, in, in forms of self-reflection, cr create counter narratives to some of the, the mainstream narratives that were coming to them based on their request to be more visible and to be more included in the workplace. So when you think about you know, some of the things that came up in, the, in, our, in our conversation in this counter space was the request to have like a designated breastfeeding area, right? And the narrative that was being told to some of the mothers in their workplaces was, was that, you know, it was, you know, a privilege for them and it was extra space and why should it go to mothers when that space can be going to uh, utilize in other ways, right? So they were feeling this sense of, you know what they were being, what they were asking of their organizations were was an excessive request, right? So some of the reflections and the shared experiences in this communal space of the CPAR helped them to shift their perspective on a micro level of transforming this idea of fear and this idea of, you know, I regret asking because I don't want to seem like I'm asking for too much, to this idea that my my privacy is important and. I can control my body, right? And so this shift in their own perfect, their their understanding of the narratives and creating these counter narratives made it easier for them to actually put in formal requests or make formal recommendations, and feel empowered to request these uh, designated breastfeeding areas in the in the workplaces. And the same, you know, there's a similar experience of having designated parking spaces. You know, some women shared that they were working at you know, organizations that had, you know, thousands of employees and they're parking, you know, a quarter of a mile away from their building and they're, you know, at 34 weeks pregnant, right? And that's that same narrative of, you know, their needs and their health matters and is important and should be centered as employees of these organizations, right? So even in this process of the counter spaces, you see that they are creating policy changes and policy recommendations, but they're also creating counter narratives to some of the harmful narratives that are out in society at large, but also in their organizations that's impacting the culture, right? The culture of the work and the culture of how we look at working parents in the organizations. Hello, Nicole. A patch here. Can I wrap up in two minutes? Thank you. Thank you, Patch. And and so that informs the recommendations that were being made to the organizations, but it also was creating a transformative experience for the for the women themselves, the mothers themselves, as almost a switch in how they were uh, receiving the narratives and then generating new counter narratives to um, some of those harmful messages. And then I would just share quickly also um, my latest research is on you know how we can use tools and methods like uh, counter spaces and CPAR as a way to you know, facilitate research that is geared towards dismantling oppression, right? And how the counter spaces is, is a generative space for that self-transformation and self-reflection for those recommendations as well, but also as a space, a, a liberating space to be able to you know, center certain ways of knowledge that can be critical as we think of how to be operating in a space of anti-racism or operating in a space of anti-oppression. And so, you know, I've just finished some research that I'll, um, if you're gonna be at the Academy of Management, I'll be sharing at the Academy of Management of how we use, you know, tools like counter spaces to, to almost curate, you know, ways of knowing that is, is can be very, very, very vital to uh, understanding how oppression shows up in the workplace and how we can use these types of research tools to dismantle oppression. Thanks, Patch. All right. Thank you very much, Nicole, for um, discussing how action research could be used to tackle very sensitive issues. So we learned that there is a methodology or a set of tools that researchers can use to tackle sensitive issues. All right. 
Um, for the participants, we are aware that uh, there are some questions. I see some questions from Vini and Angela. But uh, to save time, uh, maybe I can encourage Sunny and Nicole to perhaps reply on the questions via the chat. Then later, if you have uh, time to discuss them verbally, then we could have this panel. Okay? So for now, I'm going to introduce to you our next speaker. So Dr. Benito L. Tihanki is the Jose E. Quisha Professor of Business Ethics at the Management and Organization Department. From the Ramon with the Rosario College of Business, De La Salle University. He is head of the Business for Human Development Network under the Center for Business Research and Development of the same university. He has taught many courses in over 38 years of teaching in the university, such as sociology, statistics, research methods, business ethics, management theory, corporate governance, uh, humanistic management, and most recently, action research as well. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn over the floor to Dr. Ben Tihang from the Philippines. Thank you, Patch. Are you able to see my title slide? Yes. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. So my presentation will segue uh, the presentation of uh, Sunny and Nicole. And I take this from the point of view of uh, faculty-led institutional entrepreneurship for inclusive business practices. I'd like to start with some personal reflections, which lead to my research questions for doing this action research. I've always asked myself, what is the role of a business academic in social change? How can scholarly theory guide systemic change? How can academics engage and collaborate with business practitioners in transforming business practice for the common good? And how can business students be prepared to practice business for social justice? The reason I ask these questions is that uh, in the Philippines, many of the business leaders go through the top business schools and uh, De La Salle University happens to be one. And we have had very robust economic growth in the, in the last 20 years. However, it's always being pointed out that despite the robust growth, inequality among our population remains very high. And in many cases, they are widening. So as a business uh, faculty who also teaches corporate governance and business ethics, I've always wondered about this which is what guided me towards this uh, series of initiatives that we did with our colleagues and uh, collaborators in the business space to try to address some of these structural issues. Now, it helps to, to bring in some theory because uh, non-inclusive business practice in the Philippines is quite institutionalized. And in sociology, we describe institutions as comprising uh, regulative, normative, and cultural cognitive elements that together act to make life stable, meaning very difficult to change and very predictable. So institutions, therefore, are semi-permanent features of societies. And in the Philippines, the, the inequality is uh, literally that, a semi-permanent feature, even though economic growth has been quite healthy. So when we look at the business practices in the Philippines, we normally think of several stakeholders that can benefit from business activity. Of course, we think of the customers as benefiting from products and services, uh, suppliers benefiting from compensation for their inputs, employees benefiting from uh, life enhancing opportunity in the company and the opportunity to grow and to support families. Uh, financiers benefit from getting returns. And of course, the government uh, benefit from taxes that are used for infrastructure. And now we normally always think also of the future and the environment as well. So by doing this, we earn the trust of the public as they view the company. However, in, in, if we look at practices, normally what is institutionalized or what is semi-permanent is a highly exaggerated emphasis on maximizing returns to investors and giving customers what they want, which tends to be cheaper and faster products. Unfortunately, when this uh, dual purposes are pursued by companies, this usually comes at the expense of other stakeholders. So if we look at uh, the way these institutions begin to operate and become semi-permanent, we can look at least at uh, three major pillars, we call them. The regulatory pillar, which are the laws, the sanctions, and the enforcement. The normative pillar, which is what, how we see good behavior by professions and institutions and the cultural pillar, which are people's ideas about what is good and acceptable behavior. So let's tackle these because they really make non-inclusive business practices semi 
are permanent. So one theory that really helped me gain insight to the role of academics in initiating institutional change is the theory of institutional entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. This is, uh, there is a very uh, fruitful stream of research here, but I especially appreciated Batilana's uh, synthesis of this because it helped me plan my own action. So according to the research on institutional entrepreneurship, if we are interested in institu institutional change, we need to look at the enabling conditions. And in a field, let's say in my case, in the business and business education field, we need to look at whether the field is ripe for change. So there are some indications of ripeness for change, such as uh, increasing pressures from other stakeholders, uh, the, the advent of uh, technology changes, etc. And then we also need to look at the position of the actors who will advocate change. Are, are they in a position? Are they on a platform where they can communicate certain uh, visions? Because once these two are present, then there is a possibility of divergent change implementation. Divergent simply means uh, looking at a path different from the status quo. And this begins by the social actors initiating a vision of divergent change and then working with collaborators to, to unify behind that vision. So if these two elements are present, then the chances of divergent change becomes higher. Now, in the corporate field, we've had a lot of uh, scandals and a lot of media attention because of the growing inequality. And I did try as a faculty member to effect some change, but I found out that even as an academic from a top business school, I had very limited influence. When I would write uh, regulatory agencies, they would normally reject my requests or proposals to review certain policies which led me to join two important organizations in our country, the Management Association of the Philippines and the Shareholders Association of the Philippines. And so when we apply this uh, normative model now, the goal is to reorient business leaders towards inclusive business practices. So within the university, uh, I collaborated with my colleagues to make sure that the business graduates that we produce will not contribute to that kind of non-inclusive business practice. So we introduced action research in our MBA program and we made our students know that they have a role as change agents. Uh, we promulgated the code of ethics for business, which we teach to all our business students. And then we instituted the humanistic management course requirement in, an, in our undergraduate program. So business school reform we feel is an important component of changing the institution of non-inclusive business practices. But also uh, by, part by joining the Management Association of the Philippines, uh, we were able to collaborate to produce the Covenant for Shared Prosperity, which is a commitment among business organizations to make prosperity in our country more inclusive. In fact, uh, we launched this in uh, November 5 last year and we engaged the Securities and Exchange Commission and key business leaders in our country. Uh, and here we have 25 business organizations who also, or rather uh, business networks who also signed up to support the covenant. So we are quite uh, optimistic that this will have uh, real effects on the normative pillar as the years progress. What about the regulatory pillar? This, as I mentioned earlier, discovers the laws and rules so here we collaborated with the Shareholders Association of the Philippines so that our code of corporate governance can focus on stakeholders. Uh, you will remember earlier that uh, when I shared this, that often many stakeholders are not included in the thought processes of boards of corporations. But through this advocacy, we were able to uh, collaborate with the Shareholders Association of the Philippines. And after five years of sustained effort, we were able to convince the SEC to incorporate principles of stakeholder uh, attention. So here I, I, have, I was invited to explain why the SEC code of corporate governance was really revolutionary for our country in the sense that it emphasized social responsibility in all of the dealings of the corporation and also to serve uh, the stakeholders in a progressive manner so that we have balanced development. Because our main challenge as I, uh, explained at the outset is our development is extremely imbalanced. Now, in relation to that media appearance, uh, we need to, we are also addressing the cultural pillar. 
So we have a series of uh, columns where we explain the ideas of inclusive business, stakeholder-oriented business, and we take every opportunity to explain this in business news outlets, uh, etc. It's a, a very demanding uh, part of the advocacy, but especially in these media-hungry times, there is no other way to, to change culture except by engaging media so that uh, we have a viral, uh, mimetic kind of transmission of certain ideas. So we need to debunk feudal ideas about property ownership as a source of power and thereby uh, sometimes oppression. And we need to move uh, business leaders away from profit maximization and instrumental views of human beings. So therefore, uh, with my last slide, our institutional entrepreneurship effort in the academe and in collaboration with media and professional organizations is really to help businesses reshape our country from its very imbalanced situation today to grow our middle class, which other countries in our part of the world have done, such as, for example, Thailand and Malaysia, and hopefully achieve our vision, which is in our constitution, which is really a quality of life for all and a, a rising standard of living. So we believe that this is one way that business academics can be agents of change through action research that involve professional organizations as well as through curriculum reform. Thank you very much, Patch. And that finishes my portion of the presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben. So, so far in the chat, uh, the speakers have been responding to the earlier questions of our participants, but now we have uh, the most recent one question from Katarina. So Katarina asks, are there any suggestions on a joint externally funded research project around an eco-innovation co-developed with industry partners? I wonder whether we could use action research instead of a comparative case study approach. So perhaps our speakers could discuss some uh, opportunities along these lines. Uh, may I? Sure. Yeah, I, I believe in, in our university, uh, action research towards eco-development or sustainable type of developments are always welcome. In fact, we have a uh, special research grant, we call them challenge grants, eco-challenge grants that can, be, that can be targeted for such research projects. Uh, the grants are competitive though, so only uh, one a year is awarded. So, but I think it's worth giving it a try. And of course, there are uh, many institutions, even multilaterals, who support uh, research along those areas. So maybe my co-speakers have other mm -hmm. insights on that. Perhaps opportunities for cross-cultural uh, uh, or cross-borders uh, collaboration. So could, could action research replace traditional approaches such as case study research? Oh, most certainly, especially for a topic like that, uh, action is really essential. Now, for example, in our country, solid waste management and uh, protecting uh, fisheries resources are, are top of mind for, for many of our natural scientists and business academics. So this is something that, especially when we speak of fisheries resources, they really cut across uh, country borders. That's why we always have an interesting relationship with our Chinese neighbors because of uh, issues uh, surrounding fishery resources. Mm -hmm. So definitely action research has a place there. Right. Okay. So hey, are Rina, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I want yeah. to just make a quick comment on it. So um, three universities in USA funded by the National Science Foundations, we're actually doing um, the applying the concepts of um, circular economy, um, circular economy, like, circular you know, economy, uh, against yeah. a capitalistic idea of, of living, how we can incorporate those sustainability issues into our curriculum. So in our uh, conversations, uh, I wish that we could have done better in terms of um, utilizing a different method. Uh, the case study is easy one when we approach any company case that we incorporate it into to, um, the, our teaching. But for your case of, of uh, funded research like this, I, I strongly suggest action research might work much better uh, on creating impacts than case study approach. Um, and 
I don't know if your question is more about the where you can get some funding about, or is it more for how, how is it possible for applying extra research instead of case study? Um, but we'd love to, to carry the conversation more. Yeah, I will, I will share um, for both parts of those questions in terms of where you can get funding. You know, I'm working on a project now that's being funded by the um, NSF. Um, so there is, and their funding projects related to action research as a methodology. And this project particularly is a global project, right? And it's based, all of the participants are in business management programs or organizational sciences programs. And it's around, you know, creating more inclusive incubators for funding um, startups. And so it's, you know, I think there's maybe 30 different nations represented on the, within the working group in the working session. And we're all using some form of action research to, as opposed to case studies and our, you know, the goal is to collaborate in terms of outputs of publications as well. So it is, so I'll share that it's being funded by NSF and that it's collaborative action research that's being generated across kind of, you know, country boundaries. All right, thank you for your answers. We already have the next question, this time from Rada. So thanks for this insightful session. I would like to know if the role of culture has been studied using photo voice and CPAR methods. So who would like to answer that question? Whether the role of culture has been studied using photo voice methods or the CPAR method? Um, I, I'd like to know a little more about uh, um, how you are um, perceiving or um, hmm. defining the role of culture because the photo voice as it's under the participatory action research that we believe the action of knowledge is very specific in the case at that time. So it's totally uh, 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 contingent in terms of how, how that certain setting and situations with whom and where and time is totally relevant and make the differences in terms of outcome of research and also the policies or changes that they are aiming after. So there is a totally the major aspects of the environmental aspects, including the culture. Um, but if you are thinking more of the role of culture as uh, organizational cultures or corporate culture or more as a uh, national culture. Um, yeah, but I, I don't see That's specifically in my mind that how does, if there's any publicate, you know, the, since 1992, I, I read most of the photo voice articles in the public health sector and med medical field um, and neuroscience field a little bit uh, and social work. But yeah, not so much about the role of culture in, in that article is that I know. Okay, I think Radha wants to explain further on the question. I see your yeah, video. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the answer. In fact, I had uh, the national culture in mind because uh, some in some cultures, there may be more sensitivity towards uh, the pictures and the response, you know, to that, the political system, you know, and in some other cultures, you know, this may be one of the news items. So when you're using it as a research uh, with uh, a purpose in mind uh, and as action research with a view to uh, getting a desired outcome. So I was curious to know if uh, this has been tried or have you tried in your own country, maybe in urban or rural, or maybe in different uh, cultures, if your country has different subcultures? Very, yeah, very insightful uh, question. I, I would love to see that how the culture might affect, you know, their perceptions of photos and bringing their own narratives with their own pictures, right? Some cultures are a little wary of, of the types of self display, um, but one of, the, the article that I, I read that was published about uh, uh, 10 some years ago, she did photo voice method in her classroom of teaching social entrepreneurship, um, similar manner that I did in South Korea. So the way that she used instead of, for example, that I asked students bring their own pictures or they go out and take pictures themselves. But for her case, she asked the students to bring 
the symbols or the images of things that they can define um, with that image as social entrepreneurship. So instead of taking pictures or bringing their own images themselves, students go out and, and just pick the images that was taken or drawn by other people. So they don't necessarily bring their own to share, but they share their narratives about how they chose that picture to explain the definitions of social entrepreneurship. So that was very interesting. But yeah, there is that component I didn't think at the time, but by listening to what you're saying, it might be the case students are a little, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, weary to to bring their own face to, to talk about their own life experiences. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We have our next question from Ben. Uh, he chatted. I haven't imagined of any way to apply action research, but I can see it's very promising. Uh, it's very promising potential, especially here in the Philippines. I suppose my only concern would be the safety of researchers being red tagged by state forces or agencies given the situation here in the country. So perhaps um, how could we pursue action research methods in tackling very sensitive issues? And um, is it a given that action researchers would be exposing themselves to some danger when doing uh, CPAR methods? So maybe we could give uh, insight on that because uh, we have undergraduate students who are considering action research for their thesis. So maybe uh, we could discuss that. Uh, may I take a first crack at that? Uh, Pat? Yes, yes. 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 Well, uh, the important thing to, to take into account is that action research is collaborative and dialogic. It's, it's not meant to be adversarial necessarily. For example, in the case I cited uh, from our own experience, we did advocate with the government, but we were denied our appeals to change corporate policy. But when we engaged the top business groups, that's when we were able to gain uh, important social capital with the business leaders. So I think what can complicate uh, change is when there is polarization, when it becomes an us versus them kind of dynamic. So what we tried to do was to move towards a we dynamic which is why when the Covenant for Shared Prosperity was launched, you can see that front and center were the business leaders themselves. The academics, we just moved to the background because we did not want it to be associated necessarily with us, right? Uh, the point is it's the business leaders themselves who go through a transformative uh, evolution in their thinking. Of course, I, I think the pandemic kind of accelerated this in a way because they realized that they, they really uh, badly need their employees to deliver the value for the business. And certainly if your customers are, you know, uh, dying left and right because they don't have the means to survive the pandemic, you have no market to speak of. So I suppose there's some self-interest there, but, but there is really a deep uh, realization among business leaders that things are, are not good. They, they admit it. It's just that they're within a structure. They're embedded within a regulative, normative, cultural structure, meaning they themselves cannot change it by themselves. It has to be really uh, with collaboration with other institutions. So it has to be done slowly, I suppose, but as long as we, we keep the focus that it is not a we versus them, but rather it's an us looking at our society and saying this isn't good, and, and then we move forward and change it. All right. Thank you very much, Ben. I think Nicole has uh, an answer. I was just going to share that, you know, this this qu current question is really related to the previous question around culture as well. And, you know, whereas most of my research is U.S. based and based on populations within the U.S., I do teach a class on global leadership. And in that class, I have them explore CPAR through the lens of different dimensions of national culture, right? So they look at, you know, understanding national cultures and the different dimensions within those cultures that may be recept more receptive to CPAR and counter spaces, right? Cultures that are already very collectivist, so they may be more receptive to communal types of action research or research in general versus those who are, are more individualistic and in how we can navigate, you know, um, conducting action research in those cultures. And the similar is made about 
you know, the culture of the government, right? The, co the culture of how policies are implemented in that national co culture, right? And how, how to really be strategic in a way that is conducive to the culture in, in one degree, but also creates, you know, some opportunities for to change. Because at the, you know, there, it is a balance that you have to strike because action research is very change oriented, but you do have to be sensitive about some of the, you know, the cultural norms and the cultural elements of where you are and where you're proposing to do that research. So I think, for, you know, to the question of, you know, what recommendations we would offer to students who are looking to do this work globally is that, you know, you start with that kind of assessment of the cultural norms where you are looking to do that work, right? And how you can be not in direct opposition to those norms, you know, challenging is good, right? Soft challenging is good, but how you can work in a way that even, you know, furthers the element of community, which is rooted in CPAR, right? How can you look at the nation or the government or the system that you're looking to change as a part of the larger community that you wanna be working in partnership with? I want to add a uh, quick comment on, yeah, on it. Um, and, and to me, the social justice or equality or um, whatever that we are singing out of the action research, to me, it's not a goal, but to me, it's outcome out of the conversation. So the Ben and Nicole mentions about the, the emphasis of the process of conversation, um, that we are not aiming to achieve social justice, but we are working on the consciousness raising um, the work, whether that is in teaching, uh, research and service, but out of the process of empowering the voices that's usually not shared or heard, um, then you can achieve whether that is, um, you say social justice or equality or the improving the, the people's lives or the changes of the policy or even even the improving the democracy in the society. But again, the goal of action research to me is not really social justice itself. It's more the emphasis of achieving the process together with the subjects and participants. Um, and um, the one of um, the philosophies around uh, social um, under participatory action research to me is, you know, Habermasian communicative action. So Habermas talks a lot about the emphasis of communication in democratic movement, but movement itself is not the emphasis to me is more of that process of carrying conversations with the participants. I just want to, to comment on it. Thank you very much, Sunny. So now we have uh, another question from Alexander, specifically addressed to Ben. Shouldn't companies not be responsible for the complete life cycle, including waste, pollution, uh, conflict, minerals, and raw materials? Uh, I agree 100%, Alexander. And that's exactly what I tried to show in the diagram of uh, what a multi-stakeholder uh, company tries to achieve. That it is a positive force in the socio-ecological system. Uh, but the, the systems right now are, are very strong in not uh, favoring that or not supporting businesses that move in that direction. And that's something that I think will need a lot of action research. In the Philippines, uh, circular companies, uh, sustainable business models are very early in the game. And uh, because for, for, for reasons that I explained earlier, our institutions are very weak. Uh, our inequality is very high, so there, there's a lot of trash uh, thrown everywhere. Companies use non-renewables and uh, non-biodegradable materials all the time. But there is a growing movement to, to, to uh, reform all of that. And I think the role of the business schools is important because the young people, they're more sensitive about this. And they're now becoming more discerning in the companies from whom they will buy. So hopefully these this forces will converge and shift more and more of our businesses to do what you are saying, that uh, th that is really right, that they should take responsibility for the complete life cycle of products uh, and their, their entire setting. In the SEC Code of Corporate Governance that I cited, the Principle 16, it's precisely referring to that, that the companies are responsible for the community, the stakeholders, and the environment in which they operate. But that's more in writing now rather than in practice. 
Okay, thank you very much for your response, man. Now we have a uh, next question from uh, Dr. Epi. Yeah, Dr. Epi, hello. So she mentions the more recent experience that the Filipino poor had of community pantries has a very good action research potential. However, it did not become the subject of one yet. Please comment on this. So for those who are not familiar in the Philippines, we had this movement we call the community pantries where some of our fellow countrymen would be establishing um, like an inventory of some sort that's freely available for those who are needy. So there are certain, they, uh, these pantries are strategically located where uh, uh, those who are in need could access it. So maybe we could invite uh, Ben to answer this one. So why do you think community pantries has not yet been uh, subject of an action research? Well, I am not directly aware whether anyone is doing action research on community pantries. In fact, I would be surprised if uh, no one is doing action research on this uh, because it's, it's a fairly uh, recent development. So it will take a while for an action researcher to, to see how it plays out, to document it, uh, to reflect on the outcomes, etc. I'm betting that there are action researchers uh, doing this now. And in relation to the national cultural ID question of rather earlier, uh, this kind of community sharing is a very important feature of Filipino culture. And so I think uh, because of our challenges in the pandemic, it would be a very interesting action research indeed to see how our cultural value for sharing and solidarity uh, can, can find expression through these uh, community pantries and how it can make us a more robust society to deal with not just this pandemic, but the other crisis that I'm sure will be forthcoming. Patch? All right, thank you very much. I'm not seeing uh, any more questions so far in the chat. Um, okay, so time check, it's in uh, Manila time, it's 9.35 p.m. and I've been seeing some drops in the participants, you know, the participant uh, number. So maybe before we entertain uh, other questions, we could promote our collaborations Google Doc again. So I'll be pasting the link perhaps in the chat. So those who want to collaborate, kindly uh, sign up here. Um, uh, introduce yourself, then mention your areas of interest so that we could look for potential action research opportunities, which we think is very much needed in this time where positive change is direly important. Okay? Oh, okay, so I see another chat, this time from Oliver from Switzerland. Dear Nicole, Sonny, and Ben, I like your presentations and considerations very much. Thank you. I'm working in a business school in Switzerland, and one of the challenges lies in the reluctance of lecturers and researchers to really engage themselves. Many don't really want to get involved too much and do actual research. How do you motivate them, and how do you work with that reluctance? I have my strategies, but what are yours? So by engage, I'm interpreting it as more of a, perhaps a per first person practice where the researcher is part of the actual research and first person reflections could be considered as data. So what are your thoughts about this? How do we motivate researchers to explore actual research and be brave, embrace themselves as part of the actual research itself? So I see some smiles from our panelists ladies first okay ladies first okay so maybe would, nicole go yeah okay. sure i will say that it's not just a challenge in switzerland so i would say you're not alone there we have that challenge here as well i think one of the or a couple of strategies that have been useful for me is to you know not necessarily frame it as action research um so it, it at our institution we do a lot of research around servant um, leadership and, and providing service, servant leadership as service opportunities for our students. And so because I know that that is highly uh, centered and in the evaluation at our institution, I will frame the action research project as a service or servant leadership opportunity. And then as they get involved in that project, then we, you know, we kind of unpack the action research component of it, right? So I think one strategy is to think about your institution and what is being prioritized at your institution, right? So if your institution has specific uh, initiatives or mandates around um, service learning, around uh, community engagement, 
community partnerships or strategic partnerships to, to take hold of those, right? Because you know that people will gravitate to initiatives that are being assessed or evaluated at the institutions and then use those as a way to connect to action research as opposed to starting with action research and then you know people are already checked out, right? So leverage what's, what's prioritized at your institution as a way to, to connect to action research. I'll, I'll say this similar, yeah, um, and it's it's totally challenging. I mean, before I start my talk, I just went to the AOM site and did an AOM journal search with action research or participatory action research as a title. Guess how many journal articles that I, I found? Only one. Um, and there's about 30, 40 some proceedings in AOM um, conference. So there are definitely some interest from scholars in management field but not so much for the opportunity to publish their work with action research methods um, that I need to be honest with you. But if you think about how we engage in conversation, um, as Nicole said, not a front and saying that action research method you need to adopt and how useful that is. Um, I'll suggest uh, uh, speaking their, their words and their motivational uh, uh, factor. So the, the grant that I mentioned to you about you know, how to incorporate sustainability into their curriculum in business. Uh, we have a couple econ, econ faculty teaching economics. They don't do nothing about sustainability. They have no interest. But since they get paid for participating in this grand process and, and working together and they're in it, they say, oh yeah, I'll sign up, right? But then now we are in um, about six months after they were already talking uh, instead of uh, uh, shareholder promises, and they talk about stakeholder, uh, importance of stakeholders in, in the organizations and corporations. But once they have their foot into, and there are so much for them to actually learn and change themselves, even slowly, right? So if we can speak to, again, their interests and how we can invite them um, kindly um, to participate, uh, there is a way, but I'd love to learn your strategy as well that you mentioned you do have your own strategy as well. Okay, uh, Ben, maybe put, you have one. Um, I put my answer in the chat. That, that All answer. right, okay. So uh, we mentioned Thank in the chat. Your answers. All right, okay. So uh, I think, uh, uh, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit in the chat. Okay, so we will entertain one last question since uh, we're running out of time. So this is from Adrian from Australia. So how can you conduct action research in places where sharing ideas with people from outside may not necessarily be safe? So this seems to tie back to earlier questions where we encourage researchers to be brave, but there's the feeling of not being safe in doing action research. So how do we deal with these circumstances? Maybe our panelists could share some of their ideas. How did they overcome that fear or that feeling of being unsafe? Uh, let me try. Uh, this is just to build up on what Sunny said about the importance of conversations and speaking the language of those we want, we want to engage. And I think this is really one of the toughest aspects of uh, action research. It's, it's really getting out of our skin and beginning to see the world the way others uh, see it. Now, the reason we do this is because we're building what is called a relational platform uh, where we have a, a high trust environment. Because when you have a high trust environment, then as I mentioned in the chat earlier, innovative ideas can come forth and you can experiment on little ideas. Uh, in, in my early days as an advocate, I was quite confrontive and maybe a bit, a, a bit brusque and even sarcastic sometimes. And it did not work because generally an academic is seen as somebody in an ivory tower, right? Detached from reality, et cetera. But when I changed my tactic and spent more time being with people, having conversations so that I can see the world through their eyes, I slowly got more, you know, uh, traction, I would say. Uh, some ideas that would, would, would be seen as very radical, suddenly I would see uh, business leaders trying it out themselves. So the key for me is always to let them believe that the ideas really come from their own vision and goals of what works. Uh, and, and for me, that always starts with sincere and empathetic conversations. 
Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for your insightful response. So what about Sonny or Nicole? Do you have answers to that? How could we overcome that fear or that feeling that we're not safe in doing actual research? Yeah, I, I would just share briefly, you know, as we're sensitive to time that, you know, part of the the format of action research where the researcher and and the co-researchers, right, or the participants are seen as equals and peers in the process, that also helps create spaces of trust and brave spaces because a lot of times in research, you the the participants feel, you know, a separation and they're less inclined to trust or to share because it feels like almost like you're being observed, right? Or being judged or, you know, you're not sure if you can trust the researcher. So I think by design, when you create, you know, when you take away that barrier between the researcher and those being researched and, and create, you know, uh, vulnerability, right? When I'm doing my account, when I'm in the counter spaces with my co-researchers, I'm sharing my experience as well. And because of that, it creates a space where the co-researchers trust me enough to be brave and to take some of these risks and be vulnerable because they see me also, you know, being brave and being vulnerable. So I think the design of, you know, removing that barrier between the researchers and, and the participants also helps in terms of creating a, a brave and a safe space. All right. Thank you, Nicole. So, Sonny, do you have a last, your last line for, you know, for that question before we wrap up? Yeah, I'm, I'm more of, of just waiting for um, the risk taker to start the conversations and, and then validating that voice and and slowly open up for other people to to share that's my strategy so when i go and, and work with the people that they're they're not ready to voice out sometimes even they don't know that they have voices to share until they hear other people oh yeah i do have the same concern i do like to uh, uh comment on those as well so you you have to find a way for people to to feel uh, okay to share, right? Or uh, uh, feel that other people can can do that, why not? So in the process of action research, to me, the group conversations or having community conversation is critical that they feel not only um, the types of concerns that other people share, that's the same thing that they wanted to voice out. Um, also, they are validating each other's voice and, and creating a, a, a more of actionable knowledge out of it. Um, so that collective process of conversation and how you can um, facilitate the conversation to be part of it, um, I, I think it's, it's important. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Sonny. So I think that officially ends our question and answer. So, so just to wrap up, we encountered different uh, methodologies under the whole actual research paradigm from photo voice, uh, CPAR, and actual research in, in the governance context. So um, perhaps it's challenging to embrace this new methodology or new paradigm because whereas traditional research would want researchers to be detached, actual research challenges us to be vulnerable and to be authentic in the way we present ourselves. In traditional research, maybe we think of what we can control, but in actual research, we embrace the complexity, the very moving parts of social relationships and structures that we are in. So it really takes that bravery to initiate change. And upon reflecting on it, what better time to experiment with this methodology in a time where everything seems so abnormal? We have the pandemic and we have different changes around the world. So Maybe that's a good way to think about actual research. If we are in this, this moment where we need a great restart, maybe we should also restart our way of thinking in doing research methods for better teaching, practice, and community engagement. Okay? So thank you very much for attending. So just uh, some last announcements. I think Ben would like to promote a special issue for the Action Research Journal. Thank you, ben, Pat. Uh, I would like to make a special pitch for a special issue on action research, especially as it applies to education. We want to grow the community of action researchers everywhere. And we feel that a good place to start is among teachers because we are able to touch the minds and hearts of our students in very special ways. 
uh, we need to show them that research is not just something that ends up in the library, but really transforms lives. So for any of you who are doing action research already, this, this special issue is a, is a good venue for your work. But, but for students who want to try this out, or maybe are just trying it out even in their doctoral work, uh, we're also open to considering those kinds of papers. So please remember this call for, for your research and uh, we'll be happy to see your work. Thank you, Pat. All right, thank you very much. So uh, I've noticed that there are some activities still in the chats, but uh, unfortunately we are running out of time. So please do sign up in our Google Sheet so we could continue collaborating and collaboration is part of what actual research is all about. Okay, so hopefully this sparks our uh, desire to change to use research for the better or for the, for the positive outcomes that we want in the teaching, research, and advocacy. Okay, so thank you very much. I will be stopping now my recording. And if you want to stay, maybe we could have some informal chat with each other. So thank you very much. Thanks, Patch. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much, everyone. That was nice.